Hmm. No kidding. So why don't we get started? It is my great <laughs> pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Pakala. I could probably use up the entire time going through uh, honors and prizes and awards. Uh, let me be a snore. Uh, keep it very brief. Steve got his uh, PhD at uh, Stanford University and then joined the faculty at the uh, University of Connecticut and after that moved to Princeton where he is now a professor of, bio, uh, of ecology and director of the Princeton Environmental Institute. Among his many honors are uh, uh, membership in the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, he's the winner of the David Starr Jordan Prize the, from the Ecological Society, the Mercer Prize, and the Robert H. Um, MacArthur Award. And uh, in terms of his uh, science, he's done a tremendous amount over a wide range of topics. He's one of the uh, pioneers of using forest simulators to study uh, forest dynamics. He's done important work on stochastic population dynamics and also done uh, very important work on uh, thinking about the issues of global carbon uh, regimes and budgets. And I'm probably leaving uh, lots of things out, but uh, let's uh, welcome Steve. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, Davis has always been a, well, since I was a graduate student, has been a powerhouse in ecology, and it's a, it's a real treat to be able to speak to you about uh, this topic. Um, many of you know as much or more about this topic than I do. There are aspects of my sem seminars where some of you are the world's expert on it, and so I'm going to tread lightly and, uh, and try not to say anything uh, stupid. Um, this is the principal thing that I'm going to be talking about that I'm worried about. Um, uh, what we have here is the total CO2 emissions through time from 1960. This plot only goes through, I rank, think, around 2009. And what we have here is the amount that ended up in the atmosphere. It's not exactly a universal constant, but it's been about half, more like 45% for about 50 years. That carbon sink, as almost everyone in the room almost surely knows, is about evenly divided between the terrestrial biosphere, which is gaining weight, and the oceans, all right, where, where CO2 is dissolving into seawater and being sequestered. And it's this piece that I'm most worried about. During this period, it was 29% of the total carbon emitted uh, by humanity from, from fossil fuel use and from deforestation ended up in the terrestrial biosphere. And we know that by subtraction, but we know that from a whole different, bunch of different ways too. So um, over the past couple of years, um, uh, I, together with a bunch of people at the Forest Service, organized a conference of forest inventory people from around the world, and we did a data synthesis in the end. And what was interesting about the data synthesis is that um, it, we, we uh, uh, found roughly half the so-called missing carbon, the sink, um, in lands that were responding uh, from, from prior land use, that were recovering from prior land use. Call that a land use sink. But the other half uh, really did look like it had the signature of CO2 fertilization. In particular, all of the large primary forest plots across the neo and old world tropics, if you just simply bend the growth rates of the trees in all the plots and looked at them all through time, there is this monotonic, steady, inexorable move upward at about the pace that, that it ought to be. And if you look at any one place, it's chaos, right? It's going up, it's going down. But when you average across all the data, there is this inexorable upward progression. And so for me, that was fantastic news because a land use sink is expected to diminish through time. But what about a CO2 fertilization sink? It turns out that we really, really, really need the carbon sink to continue. Um, I went into a funk when the Waxman-Markey bill failed you know, a couple of years ago, and I think many of you probably did too. And it's because my analysis then, and the analysis of many others since then, and me since then, is that this has condemned us to at least 10 years of additional delay before we get serious about, about curtailing uh, the rise of carbon dioxide. Um, 450 ppm 
is now an unfeasible target, in my view. I don't think there's any way that we could reach that. We're in the 390s. We haven't yet started. There's going to be a, a, a long latent period before we get started. We're going to be there, all right, within 20 years. There is no way we're going to hit 450 ppm. I think 500 ppm is about the closest feasible target. And realistically, a single hiccup, a single misstep along the way, and we're in to 550 parts per million, all right? About a doubling is the, of the pre-industrial. Um, even if we succeed at the next likely opportunity and only prove merely human along the 50-year the, the path. So the problem is that the amount of mitigation needed to stabilize at 550 ppm is roughly doubled if the CO2 fertilization sink failed. You can do that calculation, and you roughly have to do double the mitigation over the next 50 years if you want to come in under 550 ppm. It's a big hit. Beyond that, I think it's possible that it may not even be feasible to stabilize at 550 ppm if the CO2 fertilization sink were to somehow fail. This shows, um, so, so my group uh, builds the, the NOAA um, Earth System model, the climate model that combines an atmosphere, dynamic atmosphere, dynamic ocean, and a dynamic carbon cycle and biosphere. My group builds the, the, the carbon cycle and biosphere part. And this is what our model is predicting for an equilibrium climate at 550 parts per million. And so this is like a GCM that you ran forever, but it's set up numerically to converge uh, on, the, on the steady state um, uh, climatology. And what this says is that with CO2 fertilization, the biosphere is going to store 218 petagrams of carbon. But without CO2 fertilization, it's going to lose 444. This is primarily because of the loss at high latitudes is no longer compensated for by gains elsewhere. The swing between these two is like 650 gigatons of carbon. And with a failed CO2 fertilization sink and a land use sink that's long since gone, what you have here is, is an atmospheric fraction that is considerably higher of CO2 that you emit. And this would carry you from 550 ppm to 750 or even 800. So I think it's possible if the CO2 fertilization sink fails, even if we stopped emitting CO2 at 550, we would still go on to a rough tripling of, of uh, pre-industrial CO2. And that is a recipe for disaster. That's where all the monsters come out of the closet and into the room, all right? So, so, so it's not an exaggeration to say that the fate of humanity depends on the fate of the CO2 fertilization sink. Now, will the sink fail? Well, considering its most basic biology, the way that you no doubt know it works is that you combine CO2 and water and you make, you make carbohydrates. That's what photosynthesis does. And this takes lots of nitrogen, OK? And so if you add CO2 at one end, you get more, more stuff out the other end. It's obviously more complicated than that. Increased water use efficiency is the other big piece. Well, you don't have to open your stomates as much to get the same amount of CO2 in if there's more CO2 outside, so you lose less water. So the two big benefits are CO2 to ram the reaction forward and more water use efficiency. So a sink caused by CO2 fertilization from these really zeroth order uh, characteristics should be impeded by N limitation. The idea that still in most models is Liebig's law of the minimum. Even if you give me extra carbon, if I don't have enough nitrogen to combine with the carbon to get the stoichiometry of a plant, I can't use it. Right? So Liebig's law of the minimum says if nitrogen is the lowest stave in the barrel, the amount of stuff in the system is going to be determined by that one. And the CO2 fertilization sink then should be impeded, in principle, by N limitation and favored by water limitation, at least with these sort of zeroth order simple ideas in mind. Now, current model predictions simply follow those most simple prescriptions. The current model predictions, models of the global biosphere, uniformly predict a large and persistent CO2 fertilization sink. You look at the models in the AR4, and they all do. Okay? All models predict the water use efficiency benefit. There's not a single one that predicts that the water use efficiency benefit will not be realized. 
Many models lack a nitrogen cycle, and so they can't predict anything about the effects of nitrogen limitation on the future of the CO2 fertilization sink. Those with an on cycle predict a sustained sink in the tropics because events fixing trees there are supplying the nitrogen that the ecosystem needs, and a weak or absent sink because of Liebig's law where end fixers are absent. Okay? So this is just one example of that. This diagram for uh, this model, which is actually implemented in the biosphere model that my group uh, works on, it was built by Stefan Gerber and Lars Hedin. And what it shows is the difference between the amount of carbon in the stored in ecosystems, if only carbon is present, if you have unlimited nitrogen, versus what you get in the future if there's, there's nitrogen limitation. And you can see what happens is the nitrogen limitation scrubs out the big sink that would have developed at high latitudes and in the, in the temperate zone in these strongly nitrogen limited places that don't have end fixing trees around. So that's what the models are currently telling us. Water limitation is going to be good, and limitation is going to be bad for the future of humanity. Now, as you know, global biosphere models are unbelievably complicated things. I've got a couple of quotes here. I really like the top one. The danger in creating a fully detailed model of complex system is you end up with two things you don't understand, right? That is true. <laughs> The other one is the venerable give me four free parameters and I'll make you an elephant, give me the fifth and I'll make it wiggle its trunk. Um, that was attributed, I tried to find a, a real citation for this and I've tried to do that several times and have been unable to track it down. One time I tracked it down in a citation to a guy named Bernard who supposedly said it in a meeting of the, like the French Zoological Society in 1884. Freeman Dyson, no less, attributes it to John von Neumann. He wishes, right? But there it is. Now, I think that there's no reason to trust these models at all, and I make one of them, all right? When I make a model like this, when I made this model, there were hundreds of operational decisions I had to make. Hundreds of operational decisions where I said it could go this way or it could go that way. Well, maybe it goes this way, all right? And what happens is that when you first turn on a model like that, you say, I don't like the output. Looks like uh, it looks awful, right? There's a rainforest in New, you know, in New Zealand, and there's all this stuff that's wrong. And so you think, what could be wrong? And you think back on all those operational decisions, and you say, oh, it must have been that one. So you change it, and it didn't work, and you say, no, that wasn't it. And you keep doing it until you give yourself an A, right? And right, that's what happens, right? So to design this model, I had to loosen the scientific standards I use elsewhere, and not by a little bit, but by a lot. This is the nature of an ecological crisis. The policy world actually needs an answer based on the best available science. The science isn't ready, and that's just tough, okay? But that doesn't mean I have to believe it. It's just the best I can do. I don't know about everybody else's model, but I have a hunch that they had, didn't know the answer to all those questions I had to ask myself, all right? So what, why do the models seem to get the right answer if you've looked at this literature, you know? And the answer is tuning to the data that we have. And when they go in the future, you get a cornucopia of prediction, which is exactly what you expect if you've got a bunch of under-constrained under models where the science isn't mature, and you tune them to, 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 the current, to the current data. And so we get this explosion of prediction. And the answer is we really just can't trust what the models are predicting. They're all predicting a sustained carbon sink. But what happens if it doesn't come true? Now, what do the data say? Well, there are many different experiments that have been done, as you know, that have added CO2 to natural ecosystems. This, on both sides of the slide, are, is the Duke face. And the Duke face is one of uh, a couple of dozen of these things. And there are about a half a dozen that focused on forest trees. And I'm going to be primarily talking about the forest trees. And what you do in these things is, of course, double the atmospheric CO2 inside one of these rings and compare what happens to the forest in controls. Now, the data, the responses, are, are sort of widely known as being idiosyncratic and varying from place to place. Zach and Norby have a recent review in the annual, in the annual reviews, and I've also gone through the, through the data and tried to, say to, my, try to ask, what is in common with, with, with every face or just about every face? And there are a couple of things. First of all, 
NPP is enhanced despite N limitation. You get NPP that's enhanced per unit nitrogen in a leaf or per unit nitrogen in a plant everywhere. The basic physiology, the simplest of physiologies of CO2 fertilization has in fact persisted in all those experiments. Some of the face experiments exist to exhibit a strong persistent sink because of increased wood growth. Wood growth is good because wood is a long-lived tissue. Every year you grow extra wood, you get more and more carbon stored because the wood doesn't fall down and decompose for a long, long time. So if you enhance wood growth, you get a long-lived persistent sink. The others show a weak sink, and it looks like it's because of large fine root proliferation, maybe root exudation too, but the important thing is you're squirting the extra carbon you get from the CO2 fertilization into a short-lived tissue, which very quickly reaches an equilibrium. So you double the production of a short-lived tissue, you double the small amount of that short-lived tissue, but because, because of it, it's, it comes to equilibrium very quickly, the sink disappears almost immediately. In addition, there's this paper recently that looked at isotopic evidence and tree growth data and was unable to find any benefit from the water saved because of CO2 fertilization in a, in a large sort of meta-analysis that include a lot of original uh, measurements too. And so global models correctly predict the CO2 fertilization of net photosynthesis as seen in face experiments. However, because they apply these simple leaf level relationships directly to the globe, whereas the face experiments do whatever they do, they actually predict the opposite of what actually happened. They predict the, the wind down of the sink under N limitation and the persistence of the sink and the facilitation of it by water limitation, and the data say the opposite, the exact opposite of what the models predict. So because they get the leaf level physiological response, at least right in sign and roughly in magnitude, the problem must be in the scaling, the extrapolation from the grid cell, uh, from, the, from the, the leaf to the grid cell. So the next 20 slides, uh, of which I will probably skip some, show my response and my group's response to, to this problem. What we've tried to do is to say, all right, let's try to double down again and look at the basic biology of the scaling. And can we make the scaling better? And so, so this is a, a, a sort of a, a backfilling exercise where, where we re, we've retrenched now for about five or six years and we're now building a new generation of global model that I'll get to uh, at the end. Okay, so where did I start? I started with forest stand simulators that I knew pretty well. Forest stand simulators, I didn't invent. I'm a Johnny come lately to forest stand simulators. Forest stim stand simulators are used all over the world to manage forests because they work. This is one example of a model working and it's what, what's made what I call the engineering transition. It's the transition when, a, when, a, when a, uh, a person who's in charge of building a bridge decides to use Newton's laws and, and not some rule of thumb that they learned in their guild, right? And so it's the same thing. When you get a model to the point where the people who just have to get the answer right decide it's better to use it than something else, you know you're onto something, right? So in this case, we had this fantastic pine beetle infestation in British Columbia. I think it's the largest in insect outbreak in history. Um, 270 megatons of carbon released into the atmosphere because of it. The problem was that because the pines were just devastated, there's a whole series of communities in there that depend on, on harvesting for uh, the wood for, for, for a living, right? And, and uh, there was enough salvage logging for maybe 15 years if they were gonna, gonna harvest all the snags and, and send them to mills. There was gonna be regenerated pine again in 35 to 50 years, but there was this valley of death from 15 to 35 years in which all of those communities were gonna have to disappear and they would just go off to do other things. However, in many stands, there was advanced regeneration of interior spruce and alpine firs sitting around, hanging out in the understory. And the question was, if somehow these were managed right, could we get them to reestablish quickly enough to fill in this valley of death until the pines were ready to go again? And the problem was that, that well, nobody had ever really studied it, so nobody ever really knew. Now, 
what happened was that um, there was a model, and actually I built the grandfather of this model, but there just happened to be a research model used by the British Columbia Forest Service that was a forest stand simulator. And it simulates the birth, growth, and death, and competition of zillions of individual trees and their dispersal. And it makes predictions at the, at the forest level literally by simulating the fate of every plant. And these models, the ones, the ones we built, were entirely parameterized with data. Sometimes these things are at the demographic level, their birth rates and death rates. Sometimes they're at the sort of phenomenological density dependence level, that the growth rate depends on the density of neighbors. Some of these, like this one, has a, a, a mechanistic competition for light and water and nutrients. But the important thing is that they all work, all right? Subsequently to this one being used for this purpose, they took a couple of different models that had been used for production forestry and monoculture, applied them to this situation, and got exactly the same answer that came out of this model. This one was the only one that was ready, though, to do it. The other ones had been targeted at the monoculture forestry that was in, in place. And so these models then calculated a threshold of advanced regeneration necessary to fill that valley of death. They went out and censused these things, checked, went out and looked for stands where they could tell what the early initial condition was and found out that the model was giving them the right answer. Did a big inventory and said, yeah, there's enough of this kind of land available. And so they passed a law that it was illegal to salvage log in those stands, okay? So it's this maturity of a scaling technology, in this case from individual to stand, that we wanted to try to leverage off of. Now, it's not so easy to do that, you can't sort of simulate every tree on Earth. And so what we did was to start to try to understand the mathematics of a forest simulator. And there's one viewed from above, everything's sped up, the trees have phototropism, so they look like they're moving around because their trunks grow in the direction of gaps and stuff, and this is all parameterized from data. And so we worked on the stochastic process that this thing is and came up with a moment approximation to the stochastic process that's phenomenally accurate. And it's shown here in these integral partial differential equations. And I don't want to talk about it, but, the, but well, I mean, I'd love to talk about it, but you would hate it. Um, <laughs> this thing is n sub i is the, is the density of species i at height z and time t over a large stand. The parameters on the right-hand side in the functional forms are the ones that are in the individual base simulator. There's no fitting here. This is a derivation, all right? And so you can see that the thing works. The squiggly lines are a bunch of different simulations of that little thing that looks like a movie. And the solid line that's going through them is the, is the prediction from, the, from the, um, the, the mathematical piece that is the same thing. And the mathematical piece, although it looks horrible, um, I always say that you know you're on the right track when the math gets simple. It turns out that it's incredibly simple for that system to analyze once you've developed just a couple of new mathy techniques. And so you can do all kinds of things like calculate um, uh, uh, old growth uh, distributions of diameters and sizes, stability criteria, blah, blah, you know, all that kind of stuff. And most important for our purposes, you can do a thought experiment and you can say, if I had an old growth stable disturbance regime monoculture of a species that was reseeding itself, and I put a tiny, a couple of plants in of another species, would those new ones invade when rare and increase or not? And so there's an analytical criterion for that, and that's going to turn out to be real important later. The fact that that's a mathematical closed form condition. So the first thing we wanted to do is to make sure that we hadn't thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And so we said, all right, we're going to fit this model at the level of the individual using growth, mortality, um, uh, and birth data from the forest inventory and analysis plots in the northern Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. And then we were going to try to predict stand chrono sequences in the same area, the successional chrono sequences. So there's a scale transition here. There's no tautology. It's really easy to get the wrong answer. All right? So you have a predicted and you have an observed. And in this case, it's the easy to predict basal area through stand age, which worked. So the best result we got was on um, these um, uh, uh, xeric soils. And what this axis shows is the change in basal area from 15 years into succession 
until just about 100 years into succession. So it's an 85 year time difference. And that's the change in the total amount of each species that, that happened during that, that 85 years. So we have a predicted and we have an observed with error bars. And I think you'll agree that's pretty good, all right? That's a legit 85 year prediction. There was no reason we had to get that answer correctly. Now for other kinds of soils, we had some problems. In particular, it turns out that red maple is doing better than it's supposed to do, all right? So we're predicting that red maple will be much more abundant than it is in chrono sequences, and that sugar maple will be less abundant than it is in chrono sequences. Number one, on, on, on those kinds of soils. And worse still, we're predicting almost no cedar in old growth in, hydro music, in, in, uh, in wet soils, and we're predicting way too much red maple and black ash. So the question is, what's wrong? Is it the model that's wrong? Or are the chrono sequences now wrong? Because conditions have changed and succession no longer points towards what the old stands were, okay? So these data are comparing stands of different ages. And if conditions are now different than they used to be, right? How do you know that this isn't, that red maple really isn't better than it used to be? And that cedar isn't worse than it used to be? And there were a lot of indications in the literature that it were, that they were. But what we did was dug into all the old data from the forest inventory in this area and compared stands of the same age. So here are stands 20 to 40 years old in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And red maple is gaining inexorably relative to sugar maple during this period. It's called the red maple paradox for that reason. Also, cedar is collapsing and black ash and red maple are advancing on it. And that's every single age class you look at, that's the case. So in this case, the model was correct and the chrono sequences were not indicative of the dynamics that we had now. So this gave us some confidence that we could move forward with this thing. Now the next thing to do was to try to add one more scale into this system. So instead of just going from individual to stand, we wanted to go from physiology, from light, water, nutrients, and plant physiology with the allocation to individual vital rates and from the individual vital rates to the stand. So we wanted to do a second scale transition. And so we built this silly looking thing, okay? And this silly looking thing is a generic tree that has a canopy and it's got a, a model of a canopy with, with, with models in it of photosynthesis and transpiration. It's got a stem, the stem has an allometry. It has a root system and the root, and the, and the root system has a physiology. This thing has a full-blown soil water hydrology submodel like the one that's in, that's in a real global model. It has a full-blown nutrient cycling model. It has nitrogen deposition, it's got rain, it's got light, it's got two stream radiative transfer, it's got all that stuff, but it's happening at an individual plants level. And what we wanted to do is to say, all right, what happens if we put these things in our mathematical machinery, can we still make it work? And the answer was yes. We could do what I think of as a giant double elimination tournament, okay? Where you compare one tree's type strategy against another, where you've changed some of these parameters, and say, under the current condition, who's the winner in the end? Who can invade but can't be invaded, all right? Using that mathematical condition. And so we tried this with a whole bunch of different um, kinds of, of traits. And I'm only gonna show you results for what I think of as the most important traits here, which are allocational traits between leaves, stem, and roots, because that's where the face experiments were, were, were showing us some, some action. So, so the idea here is that we're gonna do this now massive mathematical competitive elimination. It's like what would happen if you took every possible strategy, threw it all into the world's largest computer, or even bigger than that, and ran a simulator and to find out who the winner was gonna be. One other important thing I wanna say, in the model I'll show you, these below ground resources are shared among individuals, all right? And that's because of work, early work, that, that we reviewed on, on um, uh, the overlap of rooting zones. And in general, if you look at trees, there's a whole bunch of old work on this where they use big steam hoses to, 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 uh, and, 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 and high pressure water to, to excavate rooting zones. 
the rooting zone area differs from place to place and species to species, but it ran from 4x the crown area to 30x. And so everybody's root system has lots of individuals in it. So sharing looked like it was a better, a better uh, assumption. So, so I want to emphasize that this is not simple optimization. Simple optimization still dominates this, this um, uh, uh, face literature. And the idea is that you have something like carbon gain that you're going to optimize. It's as though it was taking an SAT or something like that, and the, and the, the best scholar would win. Nature's game, I think, is much more like an SAT test in which you're allowed to kick people in the face during the exam. Okay? <laughs> and so you might have some sort of a game here where zero is all you do is beat people up. And one is all you do is study and take tests. Okay? And if you think about that, you're going into a room full of people with one strategy. What's the best strategy to use? Well, it's going to depend on who's there. If they're all fighters and you don't know how to fight, forget about it. They can just spend a couple of minutes each beating you up and you never get to answer a single question. All right? If they're all really good scholars and there's only one of you and you're a fighter, you can't beat them all up. All right? Some of them are going to take your place in the university. Right? And so that's what this shows. Typically when you run one of these tournaments, there is the resident strategy by definition has lifetime reproductive success of one because it's at steady state. Everybody replaces themselves. There's some resident strategy here, and if you look at the lifetime reproductive success of the rare invader, there will be some area where you can invade, in this case, to the right. You then move the invader around, and you discover that there are some places it can invade, and some places it can't, and in this model, there has, well, there hasn't always been, but in the cases I'll show you, there is only one strategy that is Invade, that is uninvadable. That for every, there, there's a single strategy that no one else conveyed, so there's a best strategy here. That's what we're looking for, is the uninvadable strategy, the single most competitive strategy. Now, there's, there's a lot of evidence that these competitive strategies, these Nash equilibria of Nash competition games, are real. This is one that I like more than any other. I don't know if you've seen this experiment. You should use it in introductory ecology if you don't. It's the simplest thing in the world. Guy took uh, soybean plants, put them in cups, but in a few of them he put some of the roots in this guy's cups and some of the roots in that guy's cup. Everybody had the same amount of resources. The only thing that was different is that the roots were either sharing the cups or they were in separate cups. And he also did it with boxes. And the interesting thing here is that when the roots were sharing, uh, versus when they were owned, what they did was they exploded the number of roots they produced and had lower fitness, lower seed set because of it. I actually didn't believe this, and so I did, my, my, uh, one of my kids who was then in, in uh, seventh grade had to do a science project, and so we, we did this, and much to my wife's dismay, in our dining and living room, built to be, during the winter, built like grow lights, everybody thought we were growing uh, dope in the house, and, and, uh, and it worked. We got twice as much spinach if we didn't let the roots see each other. Okay? And this is because there's a competitive, nasty strategy going on. These things are going to war with one another to try to fight over a commons. It's a classic economic tragedy of the commons, if that means anything to you. Now, yeah, I think I have enough time for this. I'm going to go through four things that these models predicted that surprised me, that were all germane to what I have to tell you about, which is the, the effect of CO2 fertilization on nitrogen and water. I'll say at the end, I have no evidence that the yet that the mechanisms that I'm going to tell you about at the end are correct or not. All right? I just have uh, uh, some faith in the model because we've tested a lot. These are brand new results, literally, that we've just gotten in the last month. And so, and so that's where we are. So I'm going to show you a couple of things, which is like an advertisement, but, uh, but that's all it is. Um, so we were able, the model was able to predict a bunch of things that we've never been able to predict before. One of these, this shows the fraction of NPP that goes to wood versus fine roots, foliage versus fine roots, and wood versus foliage. And the interesting thing is that if you look at data, which are the gray, gray, the, uh, the gray points, there is a massive trade-off between wood and fine roots, but really nothing else going on here. This is a trade-off between a weapon that is uncompetitive, that you use to kill your neighbors and their children, which is a trunk, 
versus a resource gathering thing. And it's exactly the kind of trade-off you get out of one of these Nash games, when under different conditions, you invest in weaponry that, rather than investing in productivity. All right? You don't get any of the traditional trade-offs you expect from theory, like the root-shoot trade-off. Just doesn't exist for forest trees, at least not in the United States, where all these data come from. Our model was able to predict, actually the quantitative prediction from our model are the black lines. Those are the most competitive strategies. Another thing is complicated results from an experiment we ran at Cedar Creek with a whole bunch of seedlings. And the complicated experiment had leaves increasing with nitrogen addition along the bottom here. That was expected because this is a nitrogen limited system. The more nitrogen you add, the more leaves you can make. We didn't expect this, which is when we add water, going from gray to blue each time adds water, we get an increase in fine roots, both in a relative sense and in an absolute sense. This is not predicted by classical theory. If you add water, you ought to, you ought to increase your, your shoot root ratios, not decrease them. Okay? This goes the wrong way, and this is exactly what's predicted by this model as a competitive effect under these circumstances. And finally, there's this crazy interaction term where the water response depends on how much nitrogen you've added, the direction of it. And we actually predict that response as a zeroth order consequence of, an ash, of, of there being an ash game. I've got two more here. One is a paradox that I've always been amazed at. If you walk along, around in the Northeast, the Black Hawk Island data, if this means anything to you from past or in post, uh, uh, shows this. As nitrogen mineralization rate increases, you go to richer and richer habitats, if you catch the leaf of any one species along the way and put it in a nitrogen analyzer, they get more and more nitrogen rich, which is what you expect. But if you catch a random leaf, they get more and more nitrogen poor because the species that succeed are progressively nitrogen impoverished. So why is that? This model predicts exactly that pattern. And finally, there's one Ben Holton and I were talking about today, why are end fixing trees common only in the tropics? But we'll leave that alone because he and I have already agreed on everything. Okay, so what does our model now predict about the effects of nitrogen and water limitation on a CO2 fertilization sink? And this is all done analytically with, um, you know, with equations. They're, they're, they're answers here. But what I have instead for you is cartoons. Okay, so we start with a single strategy. In this case, it's an allocational strategy. We've got leaves, stem, and roots. And this is a system, we're going to first consider a system in which only light and nitrogen are present. There's no water at all. This is, it rains all the time or something like that. Okay, so it's only the effects of nitrogen. All right. Um, our models are always co-limited for light and nitrogen. Um, how many leaves you can make depends on how much nitrogen you have, but the leaves do shade each other, right? So, so it's co-limited. And what you do is you start with a stand, a pure stand of that, of a single strategy. And you allow it... In, in a mathematical sense, it comes to equilibrium, all right? It, it, it becomes to steady state. So there are all different age structures under a disturbance regime that are taking place here. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an age distribution that the disturbance regime has created, okay? Now you introduce a small amount of a new strategy. So let's add a little bit more root. Because it adds more root, even though the trees take up all the end that's mineralized, on a long-term basis, they take up all the end that's mineralized, because these guys are the only game in town with a little bit more, they get a disproportionate fraction of the nitrogen, right? And with that nitrogen, they can, they can make uh, uh, some extra leaves. Now, those leaves that they've added are their most shaded leaves. They're not necessarily that good a leaf, but they've made new leaves. And the, and the, and the answer is, if the carbon gain from the new leaf exceeds the total cost you've invested, that's better, and you can show that they're going to invade when rare and eventually take over, and so you let them take over. And then you repeat that again and again and again until you find somebody who nobody can knock out. And the answer is that nitrogen-limited ESS, evolutionary or ecological stable strategy, has fine roots that exactly cancel the net carbon gain of the most shaded leaf. If they don't cancel it, you should put a little bit more in because you're going to make a profit, okay? So they cancel the carbon gain from the most shaded leaf. Now looking back on the predictions, elevated CO2 increases net photosynthesis and increases the net value a little bit of the most shaded leaf. 
if that leaf is pretty bright, because the LAI is very low, there's not very many leaves in the canopy, that happens in a really nitrogen poor place. CO2 fertilization helps that lowest leaf, and, and you're gonna invest into a lot more fine roots to cancel that new value, all right? Because you wanna build fine roots to cancel the value of the most shaded leaf. So CO2 fertilization will lead to fine root proliferation in a system that looks kind of scraggly and bright in the understory. In contrast, if it looks dark in the understory, the CO2 fertilization doesn't increase very much or at all the value of the most shaded leaf because that thing was already producing nothing, all right? You elevate it a little bit and you only need a little bit of fine roots to cancel it. All the rest of the carbon that comes from the photosynthesis goes into the tree trunk and you get a big sink. So our model predicts, this model predicts, if you have a nitrogen limited continuum and it goes from present, but you still have like a real forest there, to extreme, severe, a nitrogen limited um, uh, uh, shrubland of some sort where you can't even maintain trees, that we expect most of the sea going into fine roots here and most of the sea going into wood here. We expect a big sink there and a small sink there. All right. Now let's look about water. Water works almost the same way, except when we add water, what happens is this plant gets a disproportionate amount of the water during water limited periods, and it gets a disproportionate amount of the transpiration that happens, and so it's, extra, it's, it's able to, to, um, to, to produce more, more carbon. And if the gains exceed the costs, then you do it again, and eventually you stop. And what's interesting about this is that, I'm gonna go back to this for one second. This picture here, where the canopy's carbon gain is proportional to the resource that it's able to gather, and where the amount that, of the resource that the strategy is, is able to gather is proportional to its investment, is in fact the exact economics of the tragedy of the commons. Should I put another cow on this commons? It's gonna cost me to buy the cow, but I'm gonna get back in proportion to the number of cows that are on the commons. And the, the ESS solution, the NAS theoretic solution in the tragedy of the commons, the reason it's called a tragedy is that you keep putting cows on the ca commons until every, the best thing to do for each individual is to keep putting cows in the commons until everybody makes zero money. And this does exactly the same thing. You keep putting fine roots down until the roots exactly cancel the net carbon gain of the entire canopy during water limited periods. That's what this model predicts. Okay, so let's talk about what happens under CO2 fertilization um, if, for water then. Elevated CO2 increases net photosynthesis, increasing the value of all leaves. The competitive optimal strategy is to add fine roots whose cost exactly cancels this increased value. So this model predicts that you will not get a long-term carbon sink even though CO2 enhances photosynthesis here, and even though you have a water benefit if water is limiting during these water limited periods. All the extra carbon from CO2 fertilization goes in and prevents a large sink. So the conventional wisdom says that the sustained carbon sinks are caused by CO2 fertilization are more likely if water is limiting and less likely if nitrogen is limiting. And we, this model predicts exactly the opposite. And of course, exactly the opposite is what the data, the synthesis of the data has in fact shown. We get a leaf level benefit from CO2 fertilization, but the face experiments, many of them continue to, to CO2 fertilize, even though they're nitrogen limited because they put most of their carbon in trunks and put a limited amount into fine roots. Those that wind down a lot put most of their carbon into fine roots and prevent a sink. And of course, we've got this other paper that wasn't able to find any wood growth benefit from CO2 fertilization, uh, from the water use efficiency benefit of CO2 fertilization, which is what we're predicting here. So the good news from my perspective is that this may be okay. Um, and it's because I think that most places are probably, most places that can store carbon, all right, are, are relatively rich nitrogen limited places. They've gotta be relatively rich or they don't have forests on them and can't make a lot of wood to begin with. 
but most places are nitrogen limited, all right? And so if we've got most places that are, rel that are relatively rich but nitrogen limited that can do the carbon storage, then our model predicts that the extra CO2 fertilization is gonna to continue to go to wood in nature, all right? And so we predict a long-lived global sink if that's true but not in places that are primarily water limited, nor in places that have really severe nitrogen limitation. So the future of humanity literally depends on the future of the carbon sink. Existing global models do not predict the failure of the sink under water limitation and the persistence of the sink under nitrogen limitation. The observed strategies that this thing is predicting as a Nash equilibrium predict both of those things. And that happily implies that we're likely to see a sustained benefit from CO2 fertilization. And I sure hope it's right, all right? So we've got an enormous amount of testing to do now, obviously. But uh, this is, well, that's what I had to tell you, so. <laughs> I'm sure Steve would be happy to answer questions. Understand how the carbon sink can potentially uh, save us if um, the surplus of carbon continues and in the short term it gets incorporated into plant material, but at some point there's as much plant biomass as there could be, what happens then? Then, then we're screwed, right. Um, so, so, um, so, so save us is a relative term, right? Um, what I mean by save us is that, um, uh, so, so if the carbon sink were to fail today, we would all be facing double the number of nuclear power plants, double the number of, of wind turbines, double the number of, of carbon capture and, and sequestration power plants, and so on. It would actually double our costs through mid-century, which would be catastrophic. It's hard enough now, right? If CO2 fertilization were to fail over the long term, I also think it means we're likely, we're much more likely to get into these carbon cycle feedbacks where the losses outweigh the gains and the atmospheric concentration climbs even higher and creates a whole lot more climate damages, even if we control our emissions. If we don't control our emissions, nothing can save us. Okay, carbon. A uh, 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 CO2 fertilization from plants is just a drop in the bucket if we don't, con if we just burn it all, all right, the, without even getting into exotic stuff, we're just getting into proven reserves and the conventionals, we'll end up with about 2,300, 22 to 2,300 parts per million in the atmosphere, all right? There won't be any ice, everything's underwater, we lose all our coastal cities, it's not good. I had a question about the interior of British Columbia, how you were talking about the lodgepole pine forest, is that correct? Um, might, or in some cases in that, in that part of the province, the understory or what's coming up are subalpine firs and other mm -hmm. non-pine species. So I was wondering, um, are these, in terms of like uh, ecological <coughs> succession, are these new firs that are coming up, are they, how are they shade tolerant, intolerant versus the pine trees? So, so there's, they're way more shade tolerant. The pines can't handle even the shade from their dead needles, let alone their live ones, all right? So these are more shade tolerant. If you stopped cutting that system and stopped natural stand destroying disturbances, those uh, spruce fir would take over. Okay, and then do like, is, are, does it make sense to like measure the, um, amount of carbon per unit volume of the wood in, or like of the bowl versus like the leaves and things like that compared to the pine trees to at least in this case look at um, how the carbon sink of the interior of British Columbia might be changing because of these pine. Yeah, so, so that, that can certainly be done and the models that they brought to bear on it can actually do that. But the, their main concern is simply to keep the people who depend on that resource um, in jobs. All right, so they're just trying to save some communities that are basically one shop economies. Right. Right. Yeah. Ben. Yeah, so it's actually two parts. The first is you just talked um, about soil carbon storage because a couple of carbon climate feedback suggests that maybe some of this carbon that the plants are bringing in is actually going to be re released to the atmosphere quickly. But the other part, I think. Um, when you look at your models and you're thinking about the interactions between root versus wood allocation, 
if you're a plant, you don't put carbon into roots. Yeah, you won't store as much carbon as you would in wood in long-term pools. However, that decision doesn't seem like an optimal decision when you're dealing with nutrient <coughs> over long terms. And the extent to which the competitor that actually invests in roots may actually receive a long-term benefit as they start mining for soil nitrate and phosphorus in particular versus that plant that decided, I'm going to invest in wood. And how those two dynamics might actually play out, and I don't—I mean, I don't—I know your models don't include some of those interactions. Well, actually, right? other 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 ones do. So we've looked at both the evolution of litter quality, right? And ESS is about litter quality, and root exudation to to facilitate uh, end mineralization. So we don't have anybody that can mine, you know, nitrogen in rocks or anything like that. But we've yeah, or pho we don't have uh, phosphorus isn't in there at all, right? Okay, but but phosphorus unless it behaves exotically, like the things I just said, is, is, is going to operate just the way nitrogen does, right? There's no, um, uh, right, so, but, but in any case, the, the, um, the, what, what we predict for, for um, uh, root exudation is a small wrinkle on what I've just told you, all right? Unless you can increase it dramatically, what you'll do is you'll, you'll, you'll do some root exudation that provides you a short-term benefit, and that will change the mix of, of labile and unlabile carbon above, uh, below ground, and it'll change the nitrogen mineralization rate. And all that feeds into the system. But the competitive dynamics really depend primarily on its initial effect. All right? We could talk about why that is. If it happens fast, if that reallocation below ground happened quickly, that comes into play. But either way, it's kind of a small wrinkle. The, the litter quality story is a bigger deal, though. All right. The litter quality story is a considerably bigger deal, and so I'll just leave it at that. But there's a there's a whole story there. Yeah. I was hoping you could comment on the role of tree senescence in mitigating carbon uh, levels in the atmosphere, especially like growth rate longevity trade-offs. There's a little bit of work coming out recently that suggests faster growing trees may actually die. <coughs> Yeah, so faster growing trees definitely die younger. The question is, is that senescence, all right? Or are they just, say, is it because a lot of them are just weak, right? They, they make their wood out of styrofoam. We've looked in the FIA database to try to disentangle that a lot. Um, I had a former student named Jeremy Lickstein, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Florida, who um, looked at, at uh, um, a couple of hundred species in the United States and tried to see real evidence that you were getting declines in, in yield through time, right? And, and where the, the biomass of older stands was actually winding down. And except for Douglas fir, was unable to find strong evidence across the board, okay? So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to believe that senescence is an important phenomenon, but we, because it certainly makes biological sense, but we haven't been able to find it. The only trade-off we, we, we can find that, that is a straight longevity trade-off is the one I just mentioned. Now, with that said, um, I'm really interested right now in drought kill. Our, our models are pathetic on, on drought kill. They're ridiculous on drought kill. And so, and so there could well be, I mean, that will be an energetically expensive business. And, and so um, we've got people that are working on that hard now. An assumption that when a tree dies in your model, that you have a complete and sudden carbon loss. No, 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 no. There's a full-blown carbon and nitrogen cycle here. All right. So there's a full-blown, you know, below-ground carbon model that's like the century model. All right. And there's, and it depends on the water and it depends on the temperature. And there's a full-blown nitrogen model too. Because I was just uh, what we're referring to the slide that you had where you were talking about the beetle killed large bull pine, and you made an estimate, or someone had made an estimate of an amount of carbon loss due to beetle kill, and I'm thinking, wow, where? How do they come up with that estimate unless they're removing it from, you know, cutting it and it's going somewhere else? Yeah, so, so um, I, I, I didn't make that estimate. That was, um, um, uh, uh, so um, uh, David Coates is the guy who made that estimate. He's a, a forest service uh, forester. And, and that, was, that comes out of a paper in Nature. I can get you the, the reference on it. But I actually don't know what, the, uh, what that calculation entailed. So do your uh, ESS models come up with basically one winning strategy, or do you end up with what some uh, ESS models can have of multiple strategies, 
which seems like what nature actually has, and in yeah. particular, if you increase carbon dioxide, do some do different strategies, even do different things. Some grow more roots, and others grow more wood. So or what? So, if you build a daphic heterogeneity into the habitat in almost any way, all right, you end up with multiple strategies. Yeah. All right. Purposes, whether or not the strategies even go in different directions as far as what will happen when there's uh, increased carbon dioxide, or will all species, regardless of their constraints, whatever they are, actually just tend to push towards the same direction in response to carbon dioxide? Well, because these are analytical results, you can think about um, uh, imagine that the world was like the good years for this species or the bad years right, that this species specializes on. Imagine that it was like the rich habitat in this landscape and, or the poor habitat in this, in this mosaic. And what I told you were general results that don't depend on the edaphic features in a homogeneous place that is homogeneous in time and space in the way I just described. To get some sort of reversal, you would have to mix together results all going in one direction, and then they would somehow mix together and go in the opposite direction. It's not that that's impossible, it's just that it's unlikely. We've done some work on, uh, 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 on a system that actually has a successional mosaic in it. But, but it's true, you get a lot of diversity in those sorts of systems. I've actually been surprised at how, how depauperate these, these uh, single condition stands are. Behavioral stuff, ESS models can often obviously get where the competition drives everyone to do things in one way, but frequency dependence does sort of have insensible reasons why Someone doing exactly the opposite can slip in because everyone's gone that That's way. That's right. But I could probably make up something models. that would work, you know, <laughs> put allelopathic compounds in or something like that, right? There are things that can be done, but, and it's not that there isn't founder control and other kinds of interesting coexistence over parts of the parameter space in these, in these models. It's just that there exists a strategy that'll kill them all. So what about the effects of rising temperatures on tropical tree mortality? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the, as you know, um, there are strong effects on respiration. And um, the, some tropical forests have been shown to be, have, have the, where those effects are strong enough, like Deborah Clark's work, right, that um, they overwhelm uh, the temperature effects. That happens naturally in GCM models over, all over the place. So much so that, that one of the big problems with those um, models is that they tend to lose the Amazon too frequently. Uh, it's a really common problem in our system models that the interannual variability in Amazonian rainfall is a constant source of trouble because it keeps shrinking the Amazon, all right? And so I don't see any evidence of, of a systematic failure in the you're right, where everything seems to be going the wrong way. What struck me about the face data when I checked my model and then everybody else's is that everything was the opposite. All right, All right thanks for listening. <laughs>